Hello everybody, dear colleagues, Department of Endocrinology, Tbilisi State Medical University, present a lecture, Diabetes Complications, Part 3, Diabetic Eye Disease and Chronic Kidney Disease in Diabetes. Lecture is given by the Head of Endocrinology Department of Tbilisi State Medical University, Professor David Metrovelli. So, Diabetic eye disease. Great attention has been paid to the problem of diabetic retinopathy in Georgia for a long time. A major event in this matter was the publication more than half a century ago, in 1968, of the manual of the great Georgian ethnologist academician Vajra Lekshvili and the English ophthalmologist David John Scott, Diabetic Retinopathy. It's a photo of the book, Diabetic Retinopathy, on Russian, and the photo of Vajra Likshvili Ivareli and co-author of David John Scott. This book was remarkable not only for its content, which is very important, but also because it uh, was the first edition by the co-authorship of scientists from the Soviet Union and the capitalist country Great Britain. During the Cold, Cold War, it was also an event of great political significance at that time. This monograph is recognized and popular not only among ophthalmologists but also among specialists in various fields of medicine interested in diabetology. The importance of this publication has to the test of time and until recently is cited by various authors in their scientific publications. For example, we can show the Journal of Ophthalmology, which was issued in 2015, and the authors of this paper show that one of the, in this scientific journal of ophthalmology in 2015, the authors refer to the monograph by Vajalekshvili in David Scott, which was published in 1988, so 47 years before. This fact once again pro proves that scientific and practical significance of this monograph by Vajalekshvili and David Scott. Patients with diabetes mellitus are at risk of eye disease, including diabetic retinopathy, cataracts, glaucoma, and ocular nerve pulses. At first, we should look at the eye exam for the diagnosis of diabetic retinopathy. During a comprehensive dilated eye exam, the patient receives special eye drops that dilate the pupils. The pupils open wide, allowing the doctor to see the back of the eye clearly. With a better view of the back of the eye, the doctor can look for signs of the common eye diseases that can lead to blindness, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, and age-related macular degeneration. When eyes are dilated, the doctor can clearly see the retina, optic nerve, and the macula. This is the optic nerve. The, doc the doctor might see signs of diabetic retinopathy. Early diabetic retinopathy starts with small red dots called microaneurysms and can progress to leaking blood vessels causing thickening of the retina and blurring of vision or new blood vessel growth that can bleed and cause blindness. If you have diabetes, you are at risk for diabetic retinopathy. While still...
general overview of diabetic eye disease. Diabetic retinopathy. About 5% of patients in past became blind after 30 years of diabetes, and diabetes mellitus is the most the commonest cause of blindness in the population up to 65 years of age. Cataracts. The lens may be affected by reversible osmotic changes in patients with acute hyperglycemia causing blurry vision, and the <coughs> senile cataract developed 10 years earlier in <coughs> diabetic patients compared with the non-diabetic subject. The risk can be reduced by improving blood glucose control. Glaucoma. Glaucoma is more prevalent in diabetes because of the new vessel formation in their iris, or this iris. Ocular nerve pulses, external ocular pulses, especially all the six nerves, can occur. Like other causes of mononeurosis, these pulses are acute and transient always result within two years and usually within four months. The natural history of neuroretinopathy. After 20 years of type 1 diabetes mellitus, almost all patients have retinopathy, while 60% progress to side-searing with retinopathy. In type 2 diabetes, Mellitus, 20% of newly diagnosed patients already have diabetic retinopathy and most will subsequently develop the condition. Without treatment, 50% of patients with proliferative retinopathy became blind within five years. And classification of diabetic retinopathy. It's a, <clears throat> a background retinopathy pre-proliferative retinopathy, proliferative retinopathy, advanced diabetic eye disease, and very important, the problem of maculopathy. Diabetic retinopathy is a microangiopathy which shows features of microvascular occlusion and leakage and you should be familiar with the signs of occlusion and leakage in the retina before you come to understand the pathogenesis and signs of diabetic retinopathy. So what happens to blood vessels in the presence of diabetes? Well, high blood sugar causes several things to occur in the blood vessels. These are capillaropathy, where the blood vessel walls degenerate, hematological changes, where you get deformity of blood cells and thickening of the blood, and then finally, microvascular occlusion, which is where you see irregular blood flow and decreased oxygen. I'm not going to talk more about diabetic retinopathy as a disorder uh, because that's been covered elsewhere. I'm going to launch straight into the different classification types of diabetic retinopathy. And these include background, maculopathy, pre-proliferative, proliferative, and then finally advanced diabetic eye disease. So let's start with background diabetic retinopathy. The signs of background DR are microaneurysms, retinal hemorrhages, macular edema, and heart exudates. And in the next few slides, I'm going to show you images and explain all of these signs. Microaneurysms are localized outpouchings of the capillary wall. So the capillary wall spreads out and in a certain area, um, it thickens up and, and uh, it, it moves in an outward direction. So what can happen is these microaneurysms can leak plasma into the retina because the blood retinal barrier is broken down or thrombosed. And in the image here on the right, you can see these little outpouchings, little dots of microaneurysms coming out of these tiny, tiny little um, uh, blood vessels. 
So the signs include tiny little red dots, initially temporal to the fovea, which are the earliest signs of diabetic retinopathy. But they are hard to see when you're looking at the fundus and they're actually more obvious during um, fundus fluorescein angiography. And you can see here, this image is of the eye that's had a, a fundus fluorescein angiogram and these tiny little specks are uh, microaneurysms. It's quite easy to get these confused with dot hemorrhages, which are more easily seen on the retina because they're actually larger, but they're quite similar. Here I'm showing you uh, retinal hemorrhages and hemorrhages can appear actually um, either in the retinal nerve fiber layer and these have a flame-like appearance or they can be intraretinal and located in the middle layers of the retina and have a red dot blot appearance. So these dot blot hemorrhages are, can, uh, are a larger uh, version of microaneurysms that they, they look similar on the retina. The next sign of background diabetic retinopathy is macular edema and this is caused by extensive capillary leakage or leakage from microaneurysms and dilated capillaries and so what happens is fluid accumulates in the inner retinal layers and if the fluid accumulates um, under the fovea, the fovea can eventually develop a cystoid appearance and we call this cystoid macular edema. You can see the uh, retinal thickening and the cystoid spaces here in the, in the OCT scan in the top image here. This bottom image shows a fundus fluorescein angiogram of a patient with macular edema and it shows this typical flower-like pattern where the cysts fill up with fluorescein and have this sort of roundish appearance. And finally, the last sign of background diabetic retinopathy is hard exudates. These are caused by retinal edema and develop at the junction of normal and swollen retina. They're made up of lipoproteins and lipid-filled macrophages and they are waxy yellow color in appearance with distinct margins. You can see some here and some here. And they're usually arranged in clumps or rings. See how they come in a clump or a ring shape around the um, retina? And they're often surrounding microaneurysms. When the leakage stops occurring in the retina, these can reabsorb, but it can take months or years. Now this is just a reminder not to confuse hard exudates with cotton wool spots. Hard exudates are made up of lipids and they're very yellow in colour and often found close to the macula. Um, they have distinct margins and they result from blood vessel leakage. Cotton wool spots on the other hand are made up of axonal debris and they're more prominent around the optic nerve where the nerve fiber layer is thickest and they're lighter or yellowy light colored yellow or white um, as opposed to the darker yellow of hard exudates and cotton wool spots are sort of billowy like clouds they don't have distinct margins and they result from vessel occlusion as, a, as opposed to um, uh, hard exudates which result from vascular leakage. The next category of diabetic retinopathy is maculopathy. Any edema, hard exudates or ischemia which involves the fovea is termed diabetic maculopathy and this is the most common cause of vision impairment in diabetics, especially those with type 2 diabetes. There are a few different types of maculopathies. They're focal in one area, diffuse, spread all around, ischemic or um, clinically significant macular edema. I'm just going to describe clinically significant macular edema here because this is the most common clinically 
And the photo shows, shown here is an image of a blurry macula with some dot blot hemorrhages and also hard exudates near it. So a thickened macula is um, e actually easier to, to detect on OCT. So you'll find that as an orthoptist, you'll be actually investigating any diabetic vision loss with an OCT on a regular basis. And here you can see thickened retina and maculopathy. Um, here is, we've got actually oedema here because um, it, it's caused a swelling and these cystic spaces to occur. The next category of retinopathy is pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Any background diabetic retinopathy that shows signs of imminent proliferative disease is what we term pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy or PPDR. And the clinical signs indicate that there is a progressive retinal ischemia occurring. Signs include cotton wool spots, intraretinal microvascular abnormalities or IRMA and vein and artery changes and dark blot hemorrhages. The risk of actually progressing to proliferative diabetic retinopathy depends on the number of lesions seen on the retina and you can actually have proliferative disease in one eye and pre-proliferative in the other. Now we already know about um, cotton wool spots, I've described these before, but over the next few slides I'm going to show you IRMA, vessel changes and dark blot hemorrhages. Here we see intraretinal microvascular abnormalities or IRMA as they're commonly termed. And they're fine irregular red lines that run from the arteries to the venules and you can see them here. They're intraretinal and they don't cross over ma any major retinal vessels. When you see these tiny changes in the vasculature, this is an indication that um, it's pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy and may progress to proliferative. Venous changes are also common in pre-proliferative DR and venous changes include things like dilated and tortuous veins. So here there's a picture of a dilated vessel. Looping is shown on the image up here, looping blood vessels. Beading is, is also where you um, can see little bead-like structures um, where the vessels be, start to look like little beads and sausage-like segmentation where the vessel looks like a string of sausages. Artery changes in pre-proliferative diabetic retinopathy include peripheral narrowing of the arteries, something called silver wiring where it looks like silver wire has been inserted into the um, artery itself and then complete obliteration where it's actually missing and completely blocked and there's as you can see in this image there's no blood getting through to this um, vessel at all. And finally here we have dark blot hemorrhages which are hemorrhagic retinal infarcts and they're found in the middle retinal layers and they're just basically exactly as described, dark blot hemorrhages bleeding into the retina. The next classification of DR is proliferative diabetic retinopathy and in this classification you see neovascularization, rubiosis and neovascularization at the disc as signs. So let's have a look at neovascularization first. This affects about 5 to 10 percent of diabetics and type 1 diabetics are most at risk with 60 percent of them having proliferative diabetic retinopathy after 30 years of having the disease. And the primary feature is neovascularization in proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So when you hear that a patient has proliferative diabetic retinopathy, it's most likely that they also have signs of neovascularization. This is caused by angiogenic growth factors um, increased by hypoxic retinal tissue in an attempt to revascularize the hypoxic retina. 
So what happens is the there's lack of um, oxygen coming into the retina and in an attempt to try and bring more oxygen in these vascular endothelial growth factors kick in and they create these new blood vessels and neovascularization. And the problem with the um, new blood vessels is that they are irregular, they're um, not formed well, they're fragile and then they burst and leak. The sign of neovascularization is this mottled mess of very fine blood vessels seen on the retina. What you have to remember is that it's very easy to look into the eye and see the um, vasculature of the retina, but don't forget that this problem is potentially occurring all around the patient's body. It's just that you're able to visualize it uh, by looking into the eye. Rubiosis uh, occurs with proliferative diabetic retinopathy and rubiosis is just simply also neovascularization, but it's neovascularization at the iris. As you can see there, new blood vessels growing in through the iris and this is definitely not a normal state of affairs. And then the other place that you can get neovascularization is at the optic disc. So um, this is described as NVD, neovascularization at the disc. If you see the term NVE um, in a patient's file, that stands for neovascularization elsewhere. And that means it's neovascularization occurring somewhere in the retina, not at the disc. Neovascularization at the disc is NVD. And you can see here in this photo, you can barely see the optic disc there because this mottled mass of uh, new blood vessels is, is covering it. Here it's not so bad, there's just a little, little area of neovascularization occurring here. And then the final category of diabetic retinopathy is advanced diabetic eye disease. And in advanced diabetic eye disease, it, this is in, indicative of a serious complication of diabetic retinopathy, which, in which affects the vision. And it can occur in patients who have not had treatment or if treatment has not been successful. And these um, signs of advanced diabetic eye disease and their complications include things like hemorrhage, and you can see this extensive hemorrhage that's occurring here in this patient's eye. There's the optic disc and this is the entire peripheral retina uh, and the macula is around here somewhere and it's a it's a it's an awful state of affairs because they um, they're, they're going to lose quite a bit of vision here. Patients can also uh, develop tractional retinal detachments and in this image here we can see um, there's a ring of uh, retina which has been pulled away um, and pulled upwards as a result of um, a stiffening up process and an and advanced diabetic eye disease. Patients can also develop uh, rubiosis, which I showed you in the previous image, and something called tractional retinoschisis too. So this is quite a severe form of, uh, of diabetic retinopathy, the final stages of diabetic eye disease. Recently, International Diabetes Federation published the clinical practice recommendations for managing the diabetic macular edema. Diabetic macular edema is a potential complication of diabetic retinopathy. In people with type 2 diabetes, diabetic macular edema causes the most vision loss. Increase availability of screening and treatment options for diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema offers the possibility of early diagnosis and management, providing opportunities to minimize vision treating retinal complications in diabetes. And what about prevalence of diabetic macular edema? The prevalence of diabetic macular edema among those with type 1 diabetes and type 2 diabetes varies by region. 
prevalence rates range from 11% for in Europe and 7.5% in some African countries. More than 21 million, 21 million people are effect, effect, affected worldwide. Approximately one in 14 people with diabetes has some degree of diabetic edema. In estima an estimated 20% of people living with type 1 diabetes and 25% of those with type 2 diabetes can expect to develop diabetic macular edema. Those diagnosed with the proliferative diabetic retinopathy are at particular risk for diabetic macular edema. Classification of diabetic macular edema. Clinically significant macular edema features retinal thickening and all adjust hard exudates and non-central involved and central involved macular edema describe the involvement of the center and the macula or the threat to it. So here we can see the classification of macular edema. Manifestations of macular edema. In case of non-central diabetic macular edema, uh, we see uh, this data and uh, in the, uh, from the fundoscopy, and it's a central diabetic macular edema manifestation and moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy with hemorrhage, hard exudates, and microaneurysm. Here. And mm, you know, the photo of moderate non proliferative diabetic retinopathy with mild diabetic macular edema, with microaneurysm, uh, dot hemorrhage, and mild macular edema. It's a mm, picture or photo of clinically significant macular edema. Moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy with macular edema, moderate macular edema here, and hemorrhage. Also, the severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy with severe diabetic macular edema. With cotton wool spots, severe macular edema, and blood hemorrhage. Cataracts. Cataracts result in reduced visual equity and cannot be improved by viewing through a pine hole. Myotonic dystrophy and steroid therapy, which are associated with increased risk of diabetes mellitus, are also associated with cataracts. Journal or snowflake cataracts are rare. Diffuse, rapidly progressive cataract <coughs> associated with very poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. The last recommendations from American Diabetes Association for Diabetes Retinopathy. Recommendations. Optimize glycemic control to reduce the risk or slow the progression of diabetic retinopathy. Optimize blood pressure and serum lipid control to reduce the risk or slow the progression of diabetic retinopathy. Recommendations for screening. Adults with type 1 diabetes should have an initial delighted and comprehensive eye examination by an <coughs> ophthalmologist <coughs> or optometrist within five years after the one third of diabetes. Patients with type 2 diabetes should have an initial dilated and comprehensive eye examination by an ophthalmologist or optometrist at the time of the diagnosis of diabetes. If there is no evidence of retinopathy for one or more annual eye exams and glycemia is well controlled, then screening every to one or two years may be considerable. 
if any level of diabetic retinopathy is present, subsequent delighted retinal examination should be repeated at last annually by an ophthalmologist or optometrist. If retinopathy is progressing or sight treating, the examination will be required more frequently. <coughs> Programs that use retinal photography with remote reading or use of a validate assessment tool to improve access to diabetic retinopathy screening can be appropriate screening strategies for diabetic retinopathy. Such programs need to provide pathways for timely referral for a comprehensive eye examination when indicated. Women with pre-existing type 1 or type 2 diabetes who are planning pregnancy or who are pregnant should be consulted on the risk of developing development and or progression of diabetic retinopathy. Eye examinations should occur before pregnancy or in the first trimester in patients with pre-existing type 1 or type 2 diabetes, and then patients should be monitored every trimester and for one year postpartum as indicated by the degree of retinopathy. Treatment recommendations. Promptly refer patients with any level of macular edema, severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, a precursor of proliferative diabetic retinopathy, or any proliferative diabetic retinopathy to an ophthalmologist who is knowledgeable and experienced in the management of diabetic retinopathy. The traditional standard treatment Panretinal laser photocoagulation therapy is indicated to reduce the risk of vision loss in patients with high risk proliferative diabetic retinopathy and, in some cases, severe non proliferative diabetic retinopathy. How is performed panretinal laser photocoagulation therapy? is a minimally invasive procedure used to seal or destroy lacking blood vessels in the retina that lead to serious retinal conditions such as diabetic retinopathy and macular edema. The procedure can also seal retinal tears and destroy abnormal tissue found in the back of the eye. Laser photocoagulation is a very safe procedure but it does have some risk, including but not limited by the bleeding, loss of vision, eye discomfort, and the need for further treatment. During laser photocoagulation, laser bones are made in the retina to target lacking blood vessels or treat the peripheral retina to slow the growth of new abnormal vessels. Laser photocoagulation carries certain risk signs it involves burning and destroying part of the retina. The whole procedure takes about 10 to 15 minutes and there is no pain involved. The surrounding looks dark and hazy out of the eye for about 30 minutes afterwards. Laser photocoagulation is usually not painful and the injection of anesthetic may be uncomfortable, and then patient may feel a slight singeing sensation or see brief flashes of a light when the laser is applied to patient's eye. The next possible way uh, for treatment of diabetic retinopathy is an intravitreous injection of antivascular endothelial growth factor ranibizumab are not inferior to traditional panretinal laser photocoagulation and are also indicated to reduce the risk of vision loss in patients with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Intravitreous injection of antivascular endothelial growth factor are indicated for centrally involved diabetic macular edema, 
which occurs beneath the ovule center and may threaten reading vision. Intravitreous injection of a antivascular endothelial growth factor RNA bezumab. Mechanism of action of this um, treatment. RNA bezumab oh, is a monoclonal antibody that works by slowing the growth of abnormal new blood vessels in the eye and decreasing leakage from these blood vessels used to treat the diabetic retinopathy. A short video illustrating a technique we use to inject ranibizumab into the eye at the University of Iowa. We first place a topical anesthetic into the eye and this is followed by a topical antibiotic. Next we inject a small amount of xylocaine subconjunctivally. Usually this is in the superior temporal quadrant. We raise a bleb of the anesthetic and allow this to remain in place for three minutes or more for anesthesia. While the anesthesia is taking effect, we paint the area of the conjunctiva where we are going to inject with 5% povidone iodine. We then remove the ranibizumab from the uh, bottle using the uh, large bore syringe provided by the company. This large syringe is then replaced with a 30 gauge needle and the syringe is checked to make sure we then have a 0 0.05 milliliter or 5 milligram dose. A lidded speculum is inserted into the eye. An area 3.5 millimeters from the limbus is marked with calipers. Often we'll replace 5% povidone iodine prior to injection. The 30 gauge needle is then directed into the middle of the vitreous cavity and the drug is slowly injected. A cotton tip applicator is placed over the injection site to prevent reflux of fluid or medication. The lid speculum then is gently removed and the eye is irrigated to remove any excess povidone iodine which is an irritant. An antibiotic drop is placed. The vision is briefly checked to make sure there's at least light perception after the injection. The patient is then instructed to go home and continue the antibiotic drops for three days. Many patients with diabetes, especially in diabetes type 2, have comorbidities of cardiovascular system. It's very important to know that the presence of retinopathy is not a contraindication to aspirin therapy for cardio protection as aspirin does not increase the risk of retinal hemorrhage. Summary on diabetic eye disease. Almost all patients will progress to retinopathy over the long term. 60% progress to side-treating proliferative retinopathy. Maculopathy affects all type 1 and type 2 diabetic patients, but there are no data that mainly type 2 diabetic patients. Medical treatment to limit the development of progression of eye disease involves aggressive treatment to achieve near normal glycemic, lipid, and blood pressure values. Early effective therapy reduces the risk of visual loss about 50%. And the next topic, chronic kidney disease in diabetes. Both in the United States and many regions of the world, chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease in patients with diabetes mellitus have reached epidemic proportions in recent years. The large prevalent diabetic and stage renal disease population in the United States involves remarkable risk in African Americans and in increasing population of elderly diabetic patients, including many octogenerations. 
in the United States and globally, over 90% of diabetic and stage renal disease patients have type 2 diabetes. The multinational epidemic of diabetic and stage renal disease had been linked to the increase in the prevalence of diabetes in many populations related to obesity, aging, and physical inactivity. It's very important data that the incidence and prevalence cases of end-stage kidney disease, uh, for example, in the United States, increased sevenfold uh, from 1980 to 2016, and prevalence increased 13-fold from the same period. And in this uh, slide, we can see the trend in the number of end-stage renal disease prevalent cases by modality in the United States population in the period from 1980 to 2016. And um, we can see that uh, the uh, amount of persons will all end-stage renal disease increase dramatically and uh, among them the most Patients are not only uh, glomerulonephritis or hypertension, but especially patients with diabetes. In 2016, data would say that about 50% of the United States population has chronic kidney disease as defined as a uh, glomerular filtration rate, GFR, of less than 60 milliliter per minute or elevated urine albumin level. Most chronic kidney disease patients die of heart disease before reaching end-stage kidney disease. Death rates are 15 to 20 percent per year for dialysis patients. Medicare spending on chronic kidney disease beneficiaries is uh, more than 79 billion. And uh, uh, medical spending of end stage renal disease beneficiaries is um, uh, 35 billion in the United States. And totally, total spending on kidney disease is 114 billion. It's about 23% of total budget. The uh, uh, kidney disease, chronic kidney disease, is very important in type 1 diabetes, but uh, among uh, this rate of uh, patients with chronic kidney disease in type 1 diabetes is about 45 to 47 percent for all mm, uh, amount of deaths from the type 1 diabetes. But it doesn't mean that uh, end stage renal disease or chronic kidney disease is, no, is rare in case of type 2 diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, the about different causes of death, uh, primary we see the cardiovascular complications. But uh, a, in patients with type 2 diabetes, uh, the uh, prevalence of chronic kidney disease is enough high. And this uh, slide shows that the chronic kidney disease we see in case of type 2 diabetes approximately 40% uh, from all amount of patients with type 2 diabetes. In patients with type 2 diabetes and chronic kidney disease, so uh, a combination of these two pathologies, diabetes, type 2 and chronic kidney disease, have an increased risk of cardiovascular events. And we see that there is a much more higher uh, rate of uh, acute myocardial infarction or mm, uh, peripheral vascular disease or mm, uh, totally death rate. And in other head, in other head, it's very important that patients with chronic kidney disease and uh, declining renal function, uh, this patient has increased the risk of 
hypoglycemia. It is well known that hypoglycemia may result in uh, life-threatening complications. So, uh, the mm, diabetic kidney. The kidney can be damaged by diabetes in three main ways. It's a glomerular damage, ischemia resulting from hypertrophy of afferent and afferent arterioles, ascending infections. Clinical nephropathy usually appears between 15 to 25 years after diagnosis and rarely develops 30 years from diagnosis. Nephropathy affects 25 to 35 percent of patients diagnosed with diabetes under the age of 30 years and is the main cause of renophilia in Europe, according for, accounting for uh, more than 30 percent of new renal replacement therapy. Some races, such as African Americans and South Asians, are at particular risk of diabetic nephropathy. Patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus develop nephropathy less frequently than those with type 1 diabetes mellitus. Both proteinuria and diabetic nephropathy are associated with an increased risk of developing macrovascular disease. There is a strong genetic effect predisposing to nephropathy. Natural history of the diabetic kidney. The progression of diabetic nephropathy towards end-stage renal failure proceeds through five stages and does not become symptomatic until renal dysfunction is severe. So, stage one, it's a functional change occur, glomerular filtration rate and fraction are increased at diagnosis. Stage two, structural change begins. Initially, the glomerulous basement membrane is thickened and the kidney is damaged, so the afferent arterial leading to the glomerulus was dilated more than the afferent glomerular arterials. As a result, the intraglomerular filtration pressure increased, further damaging the glomerular capillaries. Increased intraglomerular pressure causes increased shearing forces and increased secretion of extracellular mesangial matrix material. This process leads to glomerular hypertrophy, the sclerosis. In this picture, we see glomerulus in diabetic nephropathy with pink staining tissue illustrating mesangial, mesangial hyperplasia. Stage 3, marked by microalbuminuria. Disruption of the protein cross linkage alert alters the glomerular filter with progressive lack of large molecules into the urine. Small quantities in, of albumin can be detected in the urine and can be estimated on a 24-hour sample or more practically as an albumin creatinine ratio from the first widened urine sample. So, uh, a few words about microalbuminuria. So, uh, microalbuminuria presents in most but not in all chronic kidney disease patients. Some patients with chronic kidney disease have reduced um, uh, glomerular filtration rate without albuminuria. An independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease is the microalbuminuria. Strongly associated with this microalbuminuria with an increased risk for all cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and cardiovascular disease. Uh, it seems that as microalbuminuria is the result of endothelial dysfunction, this endothelial dysfunction is a high risk factor for development of vascular damage, uh, atherosclerosis, and vascular complications. And the next is the definition of microalbuminuria. 
there are different categories. Normal albuminuria, it means that in sport uh, collection, the amount of albumin per gram creatinine in the urine is less than 30 milligram of albumin per every gram of urine creatinine. But if amount of albumin in urine is more than 30, is 30 milligram per gram creatinine and more uh, up to 300 milligram of albumin per gram creatinine, it means that patient has microalbuminuria. But patients who had uh, albuminuria, uh, albumin concentration in the urine, 30, uh, 300 milligram per uh, every gram urine creatinine, it means that patients had so-called macroalbuminuria. But the uh, albuminuria may be estimated in 24-hour uh, collection. And in this case, if uh, during 24-hour collection urine, the albumin amount is less than 30 milligram during 24 hours, it means that it is normal. But in case of microalbuminuria, during 24 hour, the patient lost 30 milligram of albumin and more up to 300 milligram during 24 hours. And if during 24 hours, the amount of albumin in the urine is more than 300 milligrams, it means that patient has macroalbuminuria. And at last, uh, albumin may be measured in urine uh, the, in case of time collection. So uh, we can calculate amount of albumin uh, which patient lost every minute. And uh, in uh, this case, if the uh, amount of albumin is less than 20 microgram per every minute, it's a normal. But if amount of albumin is um, more than uh, 20, minute, uh, 20 microgram in every minute and more up to 200 microgram every minute, it means that patient has microalbuminuria. In case of macroalbuminuria, the amount of uh, albumin usually is more than 200 microgram every minute. Microalbuminuria may be tested for by radio immunoassay or by using sensitive lipsticks. It is pre predictive marker of prognosis progression to nephropathy in type 1 diabetes mellitus and of increased cardiovascular risk in type 2 diabetes mellitus. In stage 4, it's a overt clinical nephropathy. As glomerular filtration falls to blood pressure and falls, so blood pressure, air pressure, and plasma creatinine rise, and proteinuria increase, but not usually to levels associated with the nephrotic syndrome. Uh, light microscopic changes of glomerular sclerosis became manifest, both diffuse and nodular, and the later is known as the chemosyabolism condition. So, in this slide, we see you know, that during the time of years of diabetes, uh, creatinine clearance uh, decreased and urinary albumin excretion, excretion increased. So, uh, estimated glomerular filtration rate decreased. So now there are different stages of chronic kidney disease. This stage one, when patient has 
any manifestations of kidney damage with normal or increased glomerular filtration rate plus persistent albuminuria. In this case, the glomerular filtration rate is 90 ml per minute per 1.73 square meter and more. Stage 2 of chronic kidney disease. When uh, there is a kidney damage with mild reduction of glomerular filtration rate plus persistent albuminuria. And the glomerular filtration rate in this case is mm, uh, 60 uh, milliliter per minute mm, and more uh, up to 89 or milliliter per minute. Stage three, 3 of chronic kidney disease. When patient has moderate uh, decreasing of uh, glomerular filtration rate, uh, it's uh, among 30 to 59 milliliter per minute per 1.73 square meter. And stage four, when there is a severe reduction of glomerular filtration rate, uh, 15 uh, milliliter per minute um, uh, up to 29. A milliliter per minute. And stage five, it's a kidney failure when normal filtration rate is less than 15 milliliter per minute per 1.73 square meter. Or if patient is on dialysis. In stage renal failure, patient with nephropathy typically show anemia, normal chromic, normal cytotic, cyt normal cytic, altered calcium metabolism, low calcium, high potassium, and dyslipidemia and hypertension. Proteinuria is the hallmark of diabetic nephropathy. The urine of all uh, diabetic patients should be checked annually for the presence of protein. Many centers also screen younger patients for microalbuminuria, particularly within 30 years of diagnosis. Signs good glycemic control, early hypertensive, anti, anti hypertensive treatment, and the use of an uh, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, ACE inhibitor, at this stage may delay progression to rhinophilia. Diagnosis of diabetic kidney signs there is no diagnostic test for diabetic nephropathy, including renal biopsy, other possible causes should be considered. Renal biopsy might be required, but in practice, it is rarely necessary or helpful. And what about investigations to detect other causes of nephropathy? Tests for non-diabetic causes of nephropathy should be carried out Urine and microscopy forecast red cells and culture. Serum protein electrophoresis. Serum calcium phosphate alkaline phosphatase urate. Serum for autoantibodies including antinuclear factor. And also a renal ultrasound. Very important is the problem of infections. So what about diagnosis of the diabetic kidney infections? Urinary tract infections are more common in diabetes mellitus. Infections develop because of urine stasis resulting from autonomic neuropathy affecting bladder function. Untreated infections in diabetic patients can lead to renal papillary necrosis the area condition in which renal papilla are shed and in the urine and renal function deteriorates. Management of the diabetic kidney. Intensive glycemic control reduced 
the, the prevalence of chronic kidney disease. So uh, the, uh, this picture, uh, very important is to know um, about possible um, uh, use of um, different um, anti-hyperglycemic uh, agents in case of uh, diabetic kidney disease, chronic kidney disease. The management of diabetic nephropathy is similar to that of renal failure from other causes. Particular attention must be paid to microvascular risk factors and complications as well as the increased risk of neuropathy and retinopathy in patients with diabetic renal disease. Management of blood glucose. Therapy should aim to achieve a hemoglobin A1C of less than 7%. Once the creatinine has risen to 150 micromole per liter, metformin should not be used while the doses of the other agent should be monitored carefully. Once the creatinine is more than 200 micromole per liter, only insulin therapy should be used. So, a summary of our recommendation for management of blood glucose. Optimize glucose control to reduce the risk or slow the progression of chronic kidney disease. For patients with type 2 diabetes and diabetic kidney disease, consider use of sodium glucose co-transporter 2 inhibitors, HGLT2 inhibitors, in patients with an estimated glomerular filtration rate more than 30 ml per minute and urinary albumin more than 30, 30 mg per gram creatinine, particularly in those with the urinary albumin more than 300 mg per gram creatinine, to reduce the risk of chronic kidney disease progression and cardiovascular events and or both. In patients with chronic kidney disease who are at increased risk for cardiovascular events, use of a glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist may reduce the risk of progression of albuminuria, cardiovascular events, or both. Recommendation for management of blood pressure. Aggressive treatment of blood pressure target 130 to 80 millimeter mercury reduces the rate of deterioration to renal failure. ACE inhibitors are the drugs of choice at all stages, including normal testing patients with persistent microalbuminuria. Angiotensin 2 receptor blockers have a role when there is intolerance to ACE inhibitors. Combining an ACE inhibitor with the angiotensin 2 receptor antagonist may provide superior blood pressure control. Low diuretics are used in preference to thiazides once nephropathy is established. Combination therapy is usually required to achieve the blood pressure target. Do not continue Renin angiotensin system blockade for mere increase in serum creatinine less than 30% in the absence of volume depletion is the recommendation for management of blood pressure. For people with non dialysis dependent chronic kidney disease, dietary protein intake should be approximately 0.8 gram per kilogram of body weight per day. That's a uh, recommended daily allowance. But for patients on dialysis, higher levels of dietary protein intake should be considered. Science malnutrition is a major problem in some dialysis patients. In non pregnant patients with diabetes and hypertension, Either an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker is recommended for those with moderately elevated urine albumin 
to creatinine ratio 32 to 299 milligram per gram creatinine. And it's strongly recommended for those with urinary albumin to creatinine ratio more than 300 milligram per gram creatinine and or estimated glomerular filtration rate less than 60 ml per minute per 1.73 square meter. Periodically, monitor serum creatinine and potassium levels for the development of increased creatinine or changes in potassium when ACE inhibitors and yotensin receptor blockers or diuretics are used. An ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker is not recommended for the primary prevention of chronic kidney disease in patients with diabetes who, are, mm, who have normal blood pressure, normal urinary albumin to creatinine ratio less than 13 mg per gram creatinine, and normal estimated glomerular filtration rate. Patients should be referred for an evaluation by a nephrologist if they have an estimated glomerular filtration rate less than 30 ml per minute per 1.73 square meter of body surface area. Promptly refer to a physician experienced in the care of uh, kidney disease for an uh, uncertainty about the uh, etiology of kidney disease, difficult management issues, and rapidly progressing kidney disease. And what about other therapies? Therapy for dyslipidemia. Once proteinuria is established, the risk of macrovascular di uh, disease is sufficient to warrant the use of statins. The risk of myositis is increased in renal implant impairment when cyclosporine is used with statins or fibrates. And what about smoking? Smoking predisposed to diabetic nephropathy and should be particularly avoided once nephropathy is established because of the risk of macrovascular disease. Once a renal dysfunction has been established, therapy should be included. Phosphate binders such as calcium carbonate, vitamin D analogos once serum parathyroid hormone increase, erythropoietin once hemoglobin falls significantly, multivitamins, antacids such as renitidine and maybe another. In end-state disease, management of end-state disease is made more difficult by the fact that patients often have other complications of diabetes mellitus, such as blindness, autonomic neuropathy, or peripheral vascular disease. Once creatinine rises to more than 500 micromole per liter, renal replacement should be considered, especially if symptoms develop. Plotting the inverse of creatinine against time gives an indication of the rate of progression of renal dysfunction so that renal replacement can be planned in advance. There are three forms of renal replacement. Continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, CAPD hemodialysis, and transplantation. The usual initial therapy is CAPD. It is inexpensive compared with other replacement therapies, and it, um, it also avoid fluctuations, of, um, avoids fluctuations in intravascular volume, a problem seen in patients with <clears throat> cardiac disease or autonomic neuropathy. Vascular assess is not required in case of CAPD, which is an advantage uh, as vascular trends tend to calcify rapidly in diabetic patients. 
Hemodialysis requires vascular excess and is more prone to induce hypotension. Necrosis of digits can be a problem. Renal transplant is the treatment of choice and is whether cadaveric or less frequently live related donor. Both patient survival and graft survival are slightly reduced in patients with diabetes mellitus. Assessment of the patients to exclude live limiting comorbidity, including microvascular disease, is vital before a transplant that is performed. A segment of pancreatic graft is sometimes performed at the same time as renal graft. Also, pancreatic transplants have a limited viability owing to progressive fibrosis within the graft. They may give the patient a year or so of freedom from insulin injection. So, early changes in renal function in diabetic patients are driven by modifiable risk factors. So, it's very important. Uh, glycemia, hyperglycemia, the high blood pressure, the dyslipidemia, and proteinuria, and the lifestyle also. So, summary on the diabetic kidney. Proteinuria is the hallmark of diabetic nephropathy and is a marker of cardiovascular risk. Microalbuminuria is a predictive marker of progression to nephropathy in type 1 diabetes and of increased cardiovascular risk in type 2 diabetes. Management of renal failure is similar to that from other causes. Blood glucose, lipids, and blood pressure should be carefully controlled. Management of end stage disease is made more difficult by co-occurrence of other complications of diabetes mellitus and by the slightly poorer rate of survival of graft and patients following treatments. So, thank you for attention.